I would like to welcome everyone to A River Runs By It, a webinar presented by the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. This is the environmental and societal benefits of riparian buffers with Dr. Steven Souza. So we're gonna learn about riparian buffers, what they are, why they exist, and how they protect water quality in streams and rivers. So today should be a very exciting presentation. Without further ado, we're gonna get into some short introductions. We've got a lot of great partners and sponsors who have supported our program today. Um, and it's critically important that we have these sponsors to help promote these issues and these discussions that are important. And these are things that we don't often talk about, but conversations that need to be had with the public. So we really appreciate these guys. We're gonna give a few of them an opportunity to give a brief introduction. Then we're gonna hear a little bit from the policy director, Elliot Ruga of the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. And then we will move on to the star of the show, Dr. Steven <laughs> Souza. So first I want to thank a couple of members who will not be speaking today. Uh, these partners, the Coalition of the Delaware River Watershed and the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters are both critically important partners. We're very happy to have them on the team. And I'm gonna to toss it off quickly to my friend and colleague, Kyle Richter from the Muskanekong Watershed Association. He's gonna tell you a little bit about what we do there. We'll do a little bit of round robin of other intros and I'll take it back and introduce you to Dr. Souza in a little bit. Thank you, Juniper. Um, as Juniper said, my name is Kyle Richter and I'm the Watershed Programs Manager at the Muskinet Kong Watershed Association. We're a nonprofit dedicated to protecting and preserving the Muskinet Kong River, including its natural and cultural resources. Um, the Muskinet Kong River is located in Northwest New Jersey our headwaters is Lake Apatkong. So I saw a few of you in the chat are joining us from there. And the river flows all the way to the Delaware. Um, we're excited to partner um, on this talk because we have a goal this year of improving two miles of riparian buffers along the Muskinetong River and some of its tributaries through a project we're calling Push Back the Long. We're encouraging our residents to improve their riparian buffers to help promote um, cleaner water quality um, along the river. And a couple other exciting events we have coming up. Um, we do have a um, wild and scenic film festival coming up on February 26. It is free. Um, so please visit muskinetkong.org to register. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Christine Rogers from the Wallkill River Watershed Management Group. Thanks, Kyle. So hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you today. I work for the Wallkill River Watershed Management Group. We're a restoration organization that's based in Sussex County in Northern New Jersey. And our organization, we run three different programs. One is an agricultural outreach and assistance program where we work with farmers in the area. We run a stormwater management program um, and we run a riparian buffer program where we install forested buffers along the streams in our area. Three of our biggest projects are uh, within different towns in Sussex County. First, you have um, a project that's along the uh, upper pond skill, which is the buffer is a four mile stretch that we've done in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and a host of other organizations. This is an area that is four miles of forested buffer that has been installed and over 28,000 trees. So if you'd like to visit, um, and take a look at the buffer firsthand. You can go and walk behind the Sussex Branch Trail uh, behind the Chatterbox, Old Chatterbox Restaurant to see it firsthand. Now this spring we have a project coming up where we're looking to have volunteers come out and help us to remove some of the plastic tree tubes and stakes that are located on each of our trees. We put them on to protect against deer uh, brows and voles. So we are looking for volunteers to come help us. So stay tuned for dates that will be upcoming this spring, uh, hoping that everything with the virus settles down and we can get people out in the field again soon. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill from the Raritan Headwaters Association. Thanks, Christine. Hey, everybody. Uh, Bill Kimmer from Raritan Headwaters here. Really excited to be here tonight to hear from, uh, from, here, to hear from Dr. Steve Souza about repairing and buffers. The Raritan Headwaters Association helps protect water quality in our 470 square mile watershed, which is within 100 and Morris and Somerset counties. Uh, and repairing buffers are a critically important thing. We know it's one of the most important things we can do to help protect and improve water quality in our streams. So I'm pretty excited about the, about the subject tonight. 
Uh, we've got a couple of things coming up that folks might be interested in. We're going to do a webinar on the 24th of this month on local issues and local solutions. It's about how to address stormwater issues in your community. And then a big exciting event in April on the 17th, we're going to, uh, we're going to take a crack at doing our annual stream cleanup. So it's going to be a little different this year. Uh, you know, we'll all be careful about social distancing or uh, anti-social distancing as the case may be. Um, but we're going to do it. Uh, it'll be April 17th. That's the Saturday closest to Earth Day. Uh, so if folks are looking for something to do that weekend, you want to get out and uh, help get some trash out of the rivers, uh, just go to our website, raritonedwaters.org, or you can just Google Rare and Edwaters, uh, and the information is on there. We'll be able to, able to support you and help you find a site that's uh, hopefully close to you. So thanks, and I uh, hope everybody enjoys the presentation tonight as much as I know that I will. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lori from the Passaic River Coalition. Lori, it's all yours. Thank you, Bill. Yes, I'm Lori Howard, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the Passaic River Coalition. We're headquartered in Morristown. We're a regional watershed nonprofit that also has land trust properties. Our mission lies in protecting water quality and supply for the entire Passaic River Basin, covering urban, suburban, <clears throat> and rural areas. For more than 50 years, we've advocated for natural remedies as solutions to flooding and protection of our lands, streams, and rivers. And given tonight's talk, I thought I'd like to tell you a little bit about our own uh, ongoing riparian work in suburban Little Falls that started 12 years ago. Uh, the Passaic River runs by a neighborhood of Little Falls bungalows built along its riverbank in the 1930s. And so in 2008, we began the process of acquisition and demolition of these homes that flood repeatedly during heavy rainstorms and hurricanes. And I mean, some of the homes had been flooded 10 times at least, uh, and people stayed. Uh, but we pursued them, and uh, after making the acquisitions and demolishing, we restored the land by planting trees and vegetation to slow and absorb the floodwaters, creating a riparian buffer zone that now serves as open space riverfront for Little Falls. With an increase in rainfall and intensity and frequency that we now more fully realize, our state, counties, and municipalities really need to plan on natural solutions that protect our waters and benefit our communities economically, efficiently, and environmentally. In developed areas, it takes patience and perseverance to convince residents that flooding can be curtailed with trees and grasses rather than walls. In Little Falls, we still wait for some property owners to relocate and we're cons we have a list and many of them are waiting uh, green, uh, Blue Acres funding so that we can acquire them. And we still, every year we add trees and vegetation annual, annually. So you can really see the difference in how the, it has evolved as a, a great riparian buffer. Uh, so with that, I look forward to learning from Dr. Sousa how we might create many more riparian buffers that are really needed here in New Jersey. And now I would like to turn it to Mitch Mickley of the New Jersey Water Association. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, um, my name's Mitch. I work for New Jersey Water Association. I do uh, source water protection planning. So um, we work with smaller towns all across the state of New Jersey, uh, water and wastewater utilities, and uh, we offer a whole suite of different services. Um, drones, uh, ground penetrating radar, line location leak detection. Uh, we offer training courses for uh, certified water and wastewater operators. Um, right now we're just rolling out um, an apprenticeship program because a lot of utilities are very short staffed and a lot of people are retiring now. So they're looking for you know, sort of the next generation to come in, which is kind of exciting from my standpoint. I wanna see more uh, environmentally savvy people coming in and you know, running a Department of Public Works and water departments and things like that. That would be really cool to see. We also do um, energy efficiency audits and um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me or uh, if you have any questions, um, I guess it's uh, back to Juniper now. 
Excellent. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. Those were great introductions. I encourage everyone who's watching today to check out these organizations and their events. I should probably have mentioned that my name is Juniper Leifer and I am the moderator this evening. So I'm happy to be here with you all. Very quickly, I'll tell you about the program that I run, Lopacon Creek Initiative, because it is a program of the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. So it represents our participation with the broader Delaware River Watershed Initiative, which is a really cool effort to restore water on the Delaware. And we do lots of the same activities that you just heard about from our partners. We do stream cleanups, green infrastructure projects, citizen science, all kinds of great stuff that you can learn about on our Facebook page. So hopefully you guys will all do that. Give us a like, little pack on Creek initiative. I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and just a quick reminder, because I know we have a lot more people watching than we had when we first started. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to go back and watch it later on our YouTube channel. And if you have questions throughout the presentation, you can put them in the chat and they'll be collected so that we can try to get through as many of them as possible at the end of our presentation. So I'm gonna introduce you quickly to one more introductory speaker uh, before we move on to the main show with Dr. Steven Souza. So quickly, I want to introduce you to Elliot Ruger, who is my boss, the best boss there is. He is the Policy and Communications Director of the New Jersey Highlands Coalition, where he has worked for the last 15 years. So I give you Elliot Ruger. Thank you, Juniper, for a, a great introduction. Um, before we get to Steve, um, our featured presentation tonight, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about um, New Jersey's riparian buffer regulations and the advocacy work we do at the New Jersey Highlands Coalition in support of durable and protective riparian buffer regulations. But first I want to speak a little bit about environmental protection regulations in general in New Jersey. Private property is one of the basic natural and unalienable rights protected by the New Jersey Constitution. However, since there is no constitutionally protected right to clean water, the regulations promulgated by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection to keep our drinking water free of pollutants and contamination cannot deprive a person's right to private property. As a consequence, we have a series of highly complex regulations that serve to permit pollution than rather, rather than outright prohibit pollution of our drinking water supplies. All of DEP's land use regulations include a waiver from the enforcement of any provision of the regulation if it can be shown that the regulations impact on private property amounted to a regulatory taking of property. A regulation cannot deprive a property of its usefulness and economic value. And that extends to buffer regulations as well. DEP classifies all surface waters under the surface water quality standards. And based on the classification under the Flood Hazard Area Control Act rules, these classifications determine the width of the riparian zone, whether 50 feet, 150 feet, 300 feet, and the degree that, vege that vegetated buffer can be disturbed and the level that the waterway is protected against degradation. New Jersey has both fresh water and saline waters. Fresh waters are classified as FW1, not subject to, which is not subject to any man-made wastewater discharges, and FW2 waters, all other fresh waters except Pinelands waters. FW1 waters are non-degradation waters set aside for the posterity because of their unique ecological significance. FW2 waters are further classified based on their ability to support trout, which thrive in cooler stream temperatures. Trout classifications, including trout production, which is FW2TP, trout maintenance, TM, and non-trout, NT. Saline waters are classified as saline estuarine, which is SE, and saline coastal, SC, 
uh, SE waters are further classified as SC1, SC2, and SC3 waters based on their ability to support recreation, shellfish harvesting, and warm water species. Waters within the Pinelands Protection and Preservation Areas are classified as Pinelands Waters, PL, unless they are classified as FW2, FW1 waters. See how complicated this is? But we don't see the saline waters here in the highlands. Additionally, the uh, surface water quality standards establish anti-degradation policies for all New Jersey surface waters. There are three tiers of anti-degradation designations. Outstanding National Resource Waters, ONRW, Category 1 Waters, and Category 2 Waters. ONRW is the most protective tier and applies to surface waters classified as FW1 waters, also known as non-degradation waters, and to PL, Pinelands waters. These waters must be maintained in their natural state. Category one waters are protected from any measurable change to existing water quality because of their exceptional ecological significance, exceptional recreational significance, exceptional water supply significance, or their significance as an exceptional fisheries resource. Category one waters have more stringent anti-degradation requirements than category two waters. Lowering of existing water quality may only be allowed in category two waters based on social and or economic justification. New Jersey Highlands Coalition and some other organizations are discussing with DEP a designation for a Highlands water for all waters of the Highlands similar to the PL Pinelands designation in the Pinelands. It's because the anti-degradation policies for C1, which we see under the Flood Hazard Area Control Act rules, are protected against any measurable change to existing water quality. The Highlands Act, however, requires restoration of water quality, which renders the C1 designation inconsistent with the Highlands Act. The Highlands also provides source water to all of northern New Jersey's major river systems, including the Wallkill, the Passaic, the Raritan, and the upper Delaware rivers. And unlike the Pinelands, under which the Water Supply Management Act is prohibited, the Pinelands is prohibited from exporting water beyond 10 miles of the, of the Pinelands. The Highlands provides drinking water for 70% of the state's population in 332 municipalities in 16 counties as far south as, Glouc as Gloucester counties. So New Jersey relies on the Highlands water to a much greater significance than the Pinelands, although the Pinelands is extremely valuable for its ecological uh, significance to the state. DEP's Highlands Rules at NJAC 7 colon 38 and the Highlands Regional Master Plan already require 300 foot open water buffers for all Highlands open waters, which is consistent with the riparian zones required under the flood, ha flood hazard area rules for category one and ONRW waters. So it, we're halfway there with the Highlands. So DEP is considering implementing a Highlands water designation, but if it applies only to the preservation area and conformed municipalities in the planning area, well, all those waters already have 300 foot open waters buffers with strict anti-degradation policies, in which case we're just providing Highlands waters with, with a name change. The designation must apply to all waters in the Highlands region without regard to conformance status. In April 2020, DEP adopted amend amendments to the surface water quality standards, upgrading 600 miles of stream segments to category one based on exceptional ecological significance, 
and exceptional fisheries resources. Almost half of the upgrades were in the highlands. They had initially proposed 749 stream miles, but in the intervening 13 months since the upgrade was proposed, data shown that 140 miles of stream segments had degraded and no longer met the criteria. Hunterdon County, the Township of Raritan, and Flemington Borough are challenging the upgrades in appellate court, claiming among other things that the upgrades unfairly restrict economic development, that DEP stakeholder process was not meaningful, that the upgrades would limit expansion of the Raritan Township's wastewater treatment facility, and that the data used to justify the upgrades was not reliable, et cetera. The thing is, the upgrades are based on verified quality control data, and that DEP is really only protecting existing water quality of these streams. It is not an effort to improve water quality. To challenge the upgrades is to ask permission to degrade these, these stream, the water quality of these stream segments. It is unfair and it is an unacceptable intention. The New Jersey Highlands Coalition has joined with Raritan Headwaters Association and the Watershed Institute and represented by the Eastern Environmental Law Center to be an, an amicus submitting a brief to the court in support of DE, DEP's upgrades. Because we, we don't hesitate to oppose DEP when, they, when we feel they're not living up to their responsibility to protect the environment and the natural resource the state holds in trust. So when DEP does the right thing, such as these upgrades, we will not hesitate in supporting them in a meaningful way. So that is a summary of the state regulations that protect riparian buffers and our recent policy initiatives in protecting riparian buffers. I'm gonna hand it over back to Juniper who will introduce uh, this evening's featured presentation by Dr. Steve Souza. Juniper. Excellent, thank you so much, Elliot. That was very informative. I learned a lot. I probably should have known it all, but I did learn some stuff. Thank you so much for that. Um, yes, congratulations, everyone. You have made it to the feature presentation. We are just about ready to hear from Dr. Souza. I just wanna tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Souza has dedicated his 35 year career to the management and restoration of aquatic ecosystems, in particular lakes, ponds, and reservoirs. Steve was a founding partner of Princeton Hydro LLC, but in his retirement started Clean Waters Consulting LLC as a means to continue to provide education on water resource related issues through classes and courses taught at Rutgers, Montclair, and Temple. This allows him to continue working with Princeton Hydro, providing on-call consulting services. Steve has served as president of the North American Lake Management Society and as president of the Pennsylvania Lake Management Society. Um, and you know, I also know that there's a ton of buzz around Steve whenever he speaks. So I'm certainly excited uh, for this presentation. And without further ado, I give you Dr. Steven Souza. Well, thank you, Juniper. I Appreciate the, uh, we could have cut it off at, you know, after my name, that would have been, that would have been fine. Um, so, you know, tonight we are going to talk about, um, we, we are going to talk about riparian buffers. Uh, I really appreciate the, uh, uh, really the, the, the lead up uh, that Elliot provided. Um, and we're going to touch on a number of the things uh, that, um, you know, were discussed with, uh, by our project partners. Uh, with respect to the type of work uh, that they're doing. So um, I want to, again, extend my thanks to the Highlands Coalition for having me uh, here this evening, and uh, as well as to all of our uh, project partners and uh, Juniper and Zach and Elliot, all of the folks that are working behind the scenes uh, to make sure uh, I don't stumble along the way here. Uh, so we'll get right into it. And uh, you know, tonight, what we're going to cover um, is what's a riparian buffer. We'll look a little bit at some of the legal and environmental definitions, primarily you know, the environmental definitions. I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time really talking about the ecological functions 
in the ecological services and the difference between those uh, that are provided by riparian buffers. And then we're going to look a little bit on you know, some of the ways that riparian buffers uh, end up getting impacted and the compromised uh, conditions that that leads to with respect to water quality, our uh, benthic uh, invertebrate community, the, uh, you know, the aquatic insects, and, the, and uh, the fishery of these water bodies. And then I want to close out with some pretty neat examples of some riparian buffer restoration projects that I hope you find as uh, exciting as in, and intriguing as, as I do. What I'm not going to cover, uh, and I'm glad that Elliot did go through some of uh, these things, uh, is you know how to delineate a stream's riparian buffer in New Jersey uh, in accordance with the Flood Hazard Control Act, uh, NJC 7 colon 13. We're also not going to look at uh, you know the various factors and, and conditions that define the width of a riparian buffer, and also the other thing we're not going to look at uh, is uh, you know, let me just go back to that slide. Um, is you know what activities are allowed or not allowed uh, within the riparian buffer. As Elliot pointed out, uh, there's a lot of enabling regulatory permits that uh, uh, that really provide property owners with uh, the legal ability to uh, make at times actually some egregious changes uh, to the riparian buffer that have some significant environmental consequences. But we're not going to talk about that tonight. Uh, I want to start off with a quick definition of riparian area. And this is where things get, you know, maybe a little bit complicated in terms of terminology. Uh, what I've done is I've synthesized a very, very lengthy definition down to a few uh, bullet points. Uh, one of the main things that when we talk about riparian uh, uh, buffers or riparian areas is we want to remember that what we're talking about is a vegetated ecosystem that exists alongside of a water body. It could be a lake, river, or pond. Uh, and through which energy, material, and water pass. Now that's very important, and we'll come back, you know, in terms of why I've underlined that. But when we think about riparian buffers and riparian areas, these are very dynamic areas that uh, really function uh, in a very strong manner uh, to protect the water quality uh, of those ecosystems that they're associated with. Now, in some cases, you know, when you look at the EPA's definition, a lot of the state definitions as well, as you go from New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, throughout New England, uh, typically the riparian area will encompass uh, wetlands as well as uplands. Uh, it's going to include, uh, by definition, floodplain, or maybe not all of the floodplain, but uh, you know, a lot of the floodplain, and in some cases, even transitional uplands. Um, the riparian buffer is part of the riparian area. Again, this is as per D, uh, EPA. Uh, but just think of it as the land that's adjacent to a stream. And one of the things that I want to really kind of like kick things off with, and I think, you know, when we, you heard uh, like Christine and Bill and, and Lori talking, uh, you know, these are or components of the ecosystem that provide a lot of societal benefits. And these are those ecological services that I'll talk about where they're filtering various types of non-point pollutants and they're mitigating flood related impacts. Now I've added a couple of uh, you know, uh, references here that uh, you can go and take a look at just to again, uh, maybe uh, uh, delve a little bit deeper into some of these definitions and also in terms of the functionality of a riparian areas and riparian buffers. Closer to home, as Elliot pointed out, uh, the, uh, the width of riparian buffers in New Jersey, are uh, that's uh, really legislated or regulated under uh, New Jersey Administrative Code 7 colon 13, which is the Flood Hazard Act. And uh, as most of you know, you know the, the, it could vary in width from 50 to 150 or 300 feet in width. And that's measured on both sides of the waterway. Um, now, according to DEP, almost every single waterway that collects runoff from a contributing watershed of at least 50 acres will have a riparian zone. However, they also make the point that any stream, naturally occurring stream with a discernible channel, so this would be a defined bed and bank, is also gonna have a riparian zone regardless of how small the area is that is draining to that stream. 
So these are just some definitions, but I think, again, what you'll see here, both if you look at EPA and DEP, as well as some of the other state definitions, is that really close linkage between the riparian buffer, the riparian area, and the stream. And if you look at why we're trying to protect riparian areas and riparian buffers, it's really a function of the Clean Water Act that recognizes the importance of these features in terms of protecting clean water. Uh, and so it's a function, not so much, although they do have some fantastic ecological benefits in and in, in of themselves, it's really their ability to protect and maintain clean water. And that was something that Elliot was really stressing in terms of the importance of uh, protecting riparian buffers and actually enhancing uh, riparian buffers as well, that, that close linkage to water quality. This is just a general schematic. And you know, I could have probably pulled you know, just about any uh, schematic of a, uh, of a riparian buffer and they would have all probably looked very similar to this. My only point in using this one is just that it shows that the riparian buffer is immediately adjacent to the stream. So it, you know, it's, it's, it's an ecosystem within a larger ecosystem. And that's very important to keep in mind. So let's get into ecological services and functions. I, I know a lot of you are uh, you know, uh, ecological practitioners and you're aware of the differences here, but when we talk about ecological services, what we're really talking about are the attributes of a particular ecosystem that yields societal or cultural benefits. These are things that those ecosystems do that benefit us directly. Ecological functions, now these are attributes that yield environmental or ecosystem benefits. And I'm gonna get into you know, sort of like the, the specifics of this. Um, I'm glad you know, uh, uh, Christine talked a little bit about what's going on in the wall kill, because I think if you go from uh, you know, article to article, published paper to published paper, you'll see that uh, you know, above and beyond, uh, there is universal agreement that the ecological services and functions of forested riparian buffers and headwater riparian buffers are especially significant. And that's really kind of get back, gets back a little bit to what Elliot was talking about in terms of the importance of protecting these buffers uh, in our forested streams and in our headwater streams. Uh, you know, once we lose that, uh, there's like sort of a domino effect and it impacts not only water quality, uh, but aesthetics, the fishery, uh, the type of organisms that can reside and live in those waterways. But anyhow, you know, we'll look at ecological services and functions in a little bit more detail. So on the left side, these are some of the services, not all of them, I probably could have like doubled this list, but flood mitigation and flood resiliency, that's definitely a service that riparian buffers provide that benefit us directly uh, culturally and, 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 society, and from a society standpoint. Stream aesthetics, passive active recreation, this passive treatment of non-point source pollution, and definitely clean water. We all want clean water. Uh, and, and that's definitely a benefit uh, that we gain through healthy riparian buffers. When you look at it from the environmental standpoint, uh, the, the ecological functions that are being provided uh, nutrient and energy assimilation. Uh, so there's nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, a variety of different minerals that are assimilated and attenuated uh, by riparian buffers. That's very important because then that in itself starts to create uh, habitat and opportunity for other organisms. There is stability in those stream corridors because they're not subject to erosion. Uh, we definitely get temperature control that gets back to some of the importance of forested riparian areas and headwater riparian areas. Uh, and when you have a canopy, you have cooler water that provides the opportunity for trout uh, and other uh, sensitive species to live in those streams. We have a variety of habitat that's created uh, within the riparian buffer for both aquatic and semi-aquatic species. And then because of that, we see a tremendous amount of the biodiversity uh, in, in, within the buffer itself and then in, in the streams and the wetlands that uh, the buffer uh, adjoins. 
And then there's a lot of organic material removal. And that's very important because again, that, that gets back to this whole idea of energy transfer and the ability to uh, remove material, but then create material too in the way of organisms that support the entire food web. Okay, so how do they function? Well, you know, in an undisturbed uh, condition, we're gonna get a storm event. And during that storm event, we expect that stream uh, to become fuller uh, until it reaches a point where it starts to spill its banks. And when you have a healthy riparian buffer, uh, that uh, water jumps its banks. You want it to jump its banks. That's part of you know having a, a stream connected to its floodplain. And then all the magic happens because as that water passes through that riparian buffer, those pollutants are removed, habitat is created, energy is transferred, uh, water is slowed down, uh, and you get a lessening of the downstream uh, flood-related impacts that, are, that would occur if you did not have that direct communication between the stream and the riparian buffer. So in a non-impaired riparian stream corridor, we have a healthy buffer. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's very stable. You know, streams do move around, uh, you know, over time. That's to be expected. But there's a given amount of stability on those bed, uh, on the banks of those streams. And you don't see massive erosional problems that you do when you start to have impaired uh, buffers. Uh, as I mentioned before, as the stream jumps its banks and gets out into the riparian buffer, it's going to help dissipate some of that erosive flow and the energy that's associated with that that can be extremely damaging, not only to the environment, but to uh, you know, human-made uh, features as well. So in that way, it can, helps control flooding. It intercepts pollutants, facilitates recharge. We're, we have these healthy vegetated areas where water can soak back down into the ground. And as I mentioned before, a variety of different habitats uh, and this resiliency that you really need to have in a healthy ecosystem. This is why when you walk through a stream corridor that has a very healthy riparian buffer, you don't see these steeply incised stream banks. And it's because the stream is in communication with the riparian buffer and in communication with the floodplain. And as a result of that, the stream can easily jump out of bank and flood those areas just the way it's supposed to do in nature. Uh, when we have an unhealthy riparian buffer, you're going to see those incised streams where there's a drop off, a significant drop off between the land and the stream channel. And that's a very unhealthy situation. And we'll look at some examples of those when we talk about mitigation of these problems. So the loss of channel resiliency, you know, in the really a function of losing the buffer. And what ends up happening, sometimes it's not even these egregious impacts. These are very simple, you know, maybe what people would think of is, is uh, their right to mow down uh, vegetation, to clear uh, uh, trees. Uh, to mow right down to the uh, edge of the stream or to farm right to the edge of the stream. Uh, all of that basic clearing and filling and alteration of that riparian vegetation starts that whole domino uh, you know, effect. Uh, and the, it, it, that really leads to situations where the ecosystems become much, much, much less stable. And then as a result of that, there's a whole uh, number of ecological impairments that occur uh, in the waterway itself and in the adjacent uh, uh, riparian buffer as well as the adjacent floodplain. And then, you know, as we think about this and here's some examples, I mean, you know, when you uh, like take a look at the, you know, the picture that's in the top right hand corner, you know, this is a riparian buffer that no longer exists because essentially all the vegetation has been cleared right to the edge. You can see right here this example of how the stream is caving in, this incising of the stream. And this is a function of, of really too much stormwater and not the ability of this stream to communicate any longer with the riparian buffer or with the floodplain. And you start to get this impact. Then you add to it like, you know, simple filling as a result of like people blowing their leaves in, never mind, you know, dumping uh, debris or, or uh, you know, pushing in soil. Uh, other impacts we see, eutrophication, like down here in, in the bottom right-hand corner, is a result of too many nutrients, 
stream scour uh, where we start to get some significant erosion. This is a stream down in uh, Middlesex County that has acidic soil. So once the vegetation is gone, it's really difficult to get it revegetated, and you start to see these uh, real significant problems with the stream bank collapsing. And then, you know, worst case conditions, you end up with a combination of events that result in some, like a fish kill. So how does land development impact riparian buffers? Uh, first off, there's an alteration in hydrology. So when we talk about hydrology, we're talking about volume. There's too much water, well, conversely, too little water. If we have a lot of pavement in our riparian areas in, in our flood zone, uh, a floodplain, there's no place for that precipitation to go other than just to barrel on downstream. We need that precipitation to soak into the ground. Another ecological function that's provided by riparian buffers. That ends up filling sort of like that, that, that uh, surficial aquifer that is essentially the big sponge that gets squeezed between storm events that provides base flow. So, you know, when we start to develop and lose our buffers, what ends up happening is we alter the hydrology. There's either too much water or too little water. We have altered hydraulics. Now this refers to rate, how quickly that water comes at us. Now we've increased flow rates that ends up causing physical damage that's, you know, typically associated with erosion. We have other physical damage that, uh, as I showed in those previous slides, uh, simple clearing and filling. Uh, when you disturb these areas, it makes them very prone to invasive plant colonization. A lot of plants like, for instance, Phragmites, really they do very well in situations where the hydrology is very unstable and also where all of the uh, nat uh, natural uh, competitors uh, plant competitors for space uh, have been lost. You add to that some additional salt pollution, you increase the amount of nutrients, and it makes it great, a great haven for invasive species like knotweed and uh, Phragmites to, to colonize. We lose that canopy, as I mentioned before, because of clearing, you end up with uh, thermal impacts, and all of this leads to you know, impact of water quality and then loss of ecological services and loss of ecological functions. All the stuff that we don't wanna see in our streams and what we don't wanna see in our uh, stream ecosystems, which includes the riparian buffer in floodplain. So yeah, you know what, what goes around comes around. What might start as a little bit of clearing and filling, that over time becomes uh, you know, uh, worse and worse. Uh, we end up with that altered hydrology, more erosion, more thermal pollution, more non-point source pollution, degraded water quality, and then again, the loss of ecological services and functions. And it's all because of a little bit of watershed development, a little bit of clearing that then just starts to build upon itself. One of the, you know, my background, um, you know, I have a couple of degrees in fishery in uh, the fishery related fishery biology. Um, and there's a lot of fishery impacts uh, in, that come about as a result of uh, lost riparian buffer or compromised riparian buffer. Uh, the big thing is that loss of canopy cover. You end up with that th those thermal impacts. Uh, but then that also has a big effect on the availability and the diversity of food, particularly aquatic insects, which are critical for young fish. Uh, as you lose tree cover, you lose a tremendous amount of the aquatic insects that are critical for those uh, young fish uh, species. You also lose what's referred to as woody debris habitat, which is critical for the success of fish, uh, various invertebrates, including aquatic insects, as well as a variety of different amphibians. Uh, obviously, you end up with stream bank instability, more sedimentation, that then causes the smothering or the occlusion of fish habitat as well as aquatic insect habitat. You see big changes in the type of insects. We no longer have the filter feeding aquatic insects. We have more of the detritivore type uh, aquatic insects. So there's a whole, again, uh, uh, impact to the entire food chain. And then with that increase in eutrophication because of more phosphorus and nitrogen loading, that alter, also alters the entire food web. Uh, and, and eventually that has a big significant impact 
on the type of fish that can successfully uh, live in that uh, stream or river ecosystem. And I mentioned, as I mentioned before, we start filling our riparian buffers, start to compact them, um, and we lose flood storage. And with that, we lose base flow. Uh, so again, a quick, um, you know, there's a reference here that uh, gets into a lot more detail of uh, a lot of these direct impacts uh, to uh, our fisheries as a result of something as simple as clearing and filling uh, the riparian buffer. You know, and a lot of you may think, well, okay, we don't see that until we get into some really heavily developed types of conditions, but that's not the case at all. Uh, this data is uh, developed by Tom Schuler. A lot of you are familiar with that name, uh, a, a leading ecologist and hydrologist down in Maryland. Um, this was developed back in, well, actually data that was collected over the 80s and uh, put together in a paper that Schuler published in the 90s. But bottom line is that you start to see impacts with as little as about 15% impervious cover. Now, those of you that are planners or sit on a planning board, you know that low intensity, low, you know, uh, uh, small scale residential development uh, is typically about 20 the 25% impervious cover. So we're talking about development that's probably on the order of about one house per acre, or maybe even a little bit less that starts to trigger these types of impacts. So it doesn't take a lot to really start to uh, impair and degrade our riparian areas. How do we avoid these problems? I could spend, you know, really a, a, a whole seminar on this, but you know, uh, I think that you heard, you know, a little, you know, from Bill and Christine and, and Lori, uh, Elliot, uh, Juniper, about, you know, the, the, the measures that they're taking in their watersheds to stop the filling and, dis and disruption of riparian buffers. Something as simple as push back the mow, I love that. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we really try to educate landowners not to mow right to the edge because in, in reality, they're hurting themselves. They, you know, a lot of this comes down to like, I think fear of nature and uh, maybe it gets back to, you know, these large English meadows where, you know, people want everything nice and neat, but there's something to be said about the chaotic nature of a natural environment. There's a lot of going on, uh, really positive things that are going on there. And so this, this tendency to, to mow down vegetation so we can get to the water's edge or you know see the water more uh, easily that just leads to a whole bunch of problems uh, including invasive species uh, we need to practice good stormwater management those of you who have heard me speak in the past you know i am a major advocate of proper stormwater management particularly the implementation of green infrastructure and the use of natural techniques uh, to uh, to really reduce the volume of runoff and to promote recharge, uh, that's all very important. Not only mitigating peak flow, which comes down to controlling flooding, but doing these other things that are critically important to maintaining good stream health. And then protecting the canopy uh, and deer management. Um, I, you know, I remember, and I'm dating myself, but you know, uh, back in you know my college days, going out with our classes to uh, identify trees. I mean, we'd have a tough time getting through the understory. And really it was a function because, you know, deer were not as prevalent and uh, you didn't have as much deer damage. So deer management is also, is, you know, part of riparian buffer, uh, you know, management as well. Okay, so that's a little bit of uh, sort of like riparian buffer 101. What I really want to do is spend the rest of the evening talking about uh, a couple of case studies, uh, one up in Morris County, the other one in Huntington County. Uh, and, and these are really pretty cool projects that I had the opportunity to work on uh, while at Princeton Hydro. Um, I want to say first off that, you know, before we start doing riparian restoration, uh, you need to collect a lot of data. It's more than just going out and planting a few trees and putting a few plants in. That doesn't hurt, but to do it and do it in a way that's sustainable, 
really takes a lot of data collection because what we're trying to do is really go back and understand the natural processes associated with that stream and that stream corridor. Uh, so it does take a tremendous amount of data collection. So although I'm gonna show some of these examples, I want you to understand that before we even got started on this, there was probably you know two, three years worth of data collection uh, and a lot of analysis to get us into a point where we felt comfortable with what we were doing. With the right type of data in hand, then what we can do is really work with our site. We can understand what our opportunities are. We can understand what are uh, you know, the things that are gonna make things a bit more complex for us to, uh, you know, to implement and you know, combine those, understand our site and then start working with nature. It's really important not to force fit a solution. And I've seen this happen quite frequently with stream restoration and riparian buffer restoration where you know, somebody says, oh, we should put a J hook in or something like that. And it's not really a function of that stream in its natural condition. So what you wanna do is, is you know, make sure that you've got the right data and then use that data to, you know, to sort of like model and restore with nature, but not force fit a solution on a particular water body. Overall, you know, like I said, the design needs to make sense from an ecological perspective, um, and it needs to be consistent with the characteristics. I wouldn't do, uh, you know, a, a certain level of riparian buffer uh, improvement, a certain type of riparian buffer improvement, rather, um, down in, in, in Cumberland County as I would in Huntington County, you know, and vice versa. It's really a function of knowing site characteristics and the natural attributes of the water body in the riparian buffer. And, um, you know, if the projected end result is not in keeping, you know, with the native conditions of the area, uh, you're not gonna be successful and you're not gonna have a sustainable, uh, you know, project. So I just wanna emphasize that uh, for any of you that are, you know, doing stream restoration and riparian buffer restoration, you really need to collect a lot of data. Okay. So the first project I'm gonna talk about is Lawanica Brook. This is up in Morristown. And uh, uh, two separate projects, uh, they were uh, implemented by the Great Swamp Watershed, uh, a, a set of Watershed Association in 10 towns. Uh, both of them funded with uh, 319 grant money, uh, grant applications that I wrote for, you know, for both entities. And uh, you know, the bottom line with, with both of these projects was uh, to really restore a degraded riparian corridor, repair an eroded stream channel, and then do some work to control stormwater runoff, which was basically the, the, the underlying cause of the problems with uh, both of these uh, project sites. So uh, first project I'll talk about um, is by the Morris Township Police Department. Uh, Lawanica Brook. Uh, it's pretty close to uh, uh, Gritty Park. And um, the whole concept here was really to uh, implement a stormwater management project that was really a riparian buffer restoration project. So as you know, 319 money is really for water quality improvement and for particularly for stormwater management improvement. But we were able to implement a project of this nature uh, with the purpose being in part to improve stormwater quality and improve the water quality of Lawanica Brook. Flow is basically coming from north to south here, running in this direction. So this is what we had to work with when we started off. You know, I would say this is, you know, not unusual for a typical suburban stream running through a park. Uh, you can see here again, like that whole concept with you know push back the mow, you know where the edges were mowed right to the, uh, the the stream corridor and the riparian buffer was mowed right to the edge of the stream. That creates a lot of instability. Uh, and, you know this grass that's growing here, very shallow rooted, um, so there's not as a lot of stability. Uh, when, let me just go back. Uh, we had that lack of riparian vegetation. We had a lot of stormwater was just sheet flowing from this parking lot directly into the stream. And, uh, and then in addition to that, uh, a lot of geese, you can kind of see them up here trampling the stream, a lot of geese feces, goose feces, as well as a lot of nutrient loading associated with those geese. 
little, you know, some of you have heard me say this before, but four geese produce as much phosphorus in one day as a septic system, okay? Four geese equals one septic system when it comes to phosphorus loading. So that's a big deal when we're talking about eutrophication related impacts. Here we are, you know, during uh, the restoration phase, you can see what we've done is essentially cut back about 10 foot of uh, macadam that was part of that parking lot, uh, graded back uh, the, uh, uh, the riparian buffer to, pro to provide more opportunity for the stream to actually jump bank and set to communicate once again with the riparian buffer and the floodplain. Uh, these high energy areas, we've got some uh, coconut fiber logs here as water shoots out under this uh, culvert. It tends to pick up uh, some velocity here and that was causing some uh, erosional problems that we were able to rectify with uh, the core fiber logs. Again, this is just looking down, uh, you know, downstream. And you can see here where we've cut off uh, a good portion of the parking lot. Um, so nothing was really lost here in terms of parking, um, but you know, we've, we've eliminated that direct runoff into the stream. A little bit closer to project completion, we have our plants in place, trees, combination of uh, peat pots, as well as some gallon container plants. Uh, all of this is to protect it from uh, uh, damage by geese. Here's the, uh, so this is in June. Here we are in August. We had some really quick grow in. Uh, and you can see a variety of different types of plants that took off very, very quickly. Uh, some colonization by, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, some uh, plants like this Queen Anne's, uh, Queen Anne's lace that we, we didn't plant that actually got in here. It was pretty happy, but it looked pretty nice. Uh, you can see a lot of sedges and rushes along the uh, perimeter of the water body. And this is about a year later. Uh, now, some people may say this is a little bit too uh, wild for them, but this is what a healthy stream buffer looks like. Uh, and, and this is a very stable system now. And again, this is about three years, four years after completion. Uh, and you can still see a variety of different types of flowering plants, uh, as well as a lot of sedges and rushes. And this is an aerial photo uh, just from this year, uh, from uh, 2021, a Google Earth photo, uh, just showing the, uh, the width and uh, the uh, really, I guess this is from 2020, but you can get a sense for the width and the, uh, uh, the amount of plant cover uh, in that area. So it's very, that was a very successful project. The other project that we conducted through, you know, with this grant money uh, for uh, uh, the Great Swamp, um, part of this was done under the uh, direction of Amy S. Green Environmental. Uh, the, uh, uh, a lot of this was done uh, sort of like supplemental to the 319 project as mitigation for some wetland damage that had resulted from a power line project. Uh, and uh, JCPNL were required to do some wetland mitigation and we were able to actually, uh, instead of doing wetland mitigation, do riparian buffer uh, uh, restoration. We also, as you'll see in these photos that come up, uh, the Seton Hackney stables are here, and this is a big riding area, and horses were actually, uh, there's a paddock that ran right next to the stream, and so there was a lot of contamination uh, because of uh, you know, the horses being uh, put out the pasture here, in uh, this being used as a big paddock area uh, immediately adjacent to the stream. This is, you know, what we were dealing with at the beginning. Um, you know, some of these areas got really, really destroyed, uh, you know, where there was a lot of animals being held in a relatively small area. But you can see the stream is right here and, you know, the riparian buffer is gone. What's remaining was primarily a lot of invasive species. This was the beginning of the project. Um, it looks like a war zone, but this is what we had to do. We had to actually go in and remove uh, you know, the uh, invasive species, uh, loosen up that soil. Uh, we wanted something that wasn't really uh, you know, nicely graded. Uh, this is by design so that we could have pockets where water would sit and soak back down into the ground. 
literally thousands of dollars spent on horse fencing to keep the horses out of this riparian buffer. So this is about 25, uh, 25 foot wide in its narrowest areas and about 50 feet wide in its largest areas. And here we have, uh, these are some of the uh, uh, personnel that were hired by uh, Amy Green uh, to come in and do the uh, tree planting. There's over a thousand trees and various other types of plants that were put in. Uh, these had to be, again, protected. Uh, you know, Christine was talking about, uh, you know, these uh, uh, protective devices that you have to put around these saplings are also gonna get damaged by deer. Um, and then we have to come back out and take them down little bit later on. Uh, but here we are, uh, this is shortly, this is still the same year, like closer to the end of the growing season. And you can see we're already getting a healthy understory uh, as well as the trees are doing pretty well. And uh, this is about uh, a year later. Uh, and now we've got a, a, a really good understory uh, that's starting to develop along with uh, the, uh, the treed area within our riparian buffer. And then this is just a recent, uh, this was a, uh, I'm sorry, this was a drone, some drone footage that we took roughly about two years after restoration. So you can get an idea, this is the areas that we restored. Uh, the, the horse fencing that was put up to keep the horses out of these areas. You can see all the trees that were planted, but this extends, uh, I believe if I got my dimensions right, somewhere around a thousand feet of a restored riparian buffer. And then this is just a recent uh, 2020 uh, aerial photo, again, showing the uh, density of vegetation within our planted area. Okay, I'm gonna finish up with uh, uh, the presentation talking about Walnut Brook. This is in Minebrook Park in Flemington. Uh, not too far away from where I live and where, you know, the headquarters are uh, for uh, uh, Princeton Hydro. Um, this project was funded by the New, New Jersey Wetland Mitigation Council, uh, and it was designed and implemented by Princeton Hydro. In particular, Mark Gallagher was my partner at Princeton Hydro. He was a project manager, and I have to thank him for uh, sharing uh, a number of these slides with me. Uh, but you can see here, we had an extensive a uh, number of project partners. Uh, New Jersey Resource Conservation and Development Council actually won a governor's award for this project. But you know, this project wouldn't have happened without uh, really the strong support of all the project partners. Uh, everybody kicked in in a different way to really make this happen. So our drainage area is not that big. It's only about 1,800 acres. And if you look at the stream slope, uh, and this is important when we start to look at some of these impacts. You know, it's only 2.25, you know, percent. Uh, and the reach slope is about 1.13 percent. The thing that really should strike you, though, is the watershed land use. You know, uh, we're talking about uh, only about 27 percent of the area being developed. And any of you that know this area know that you know development here, uh, some pretty large homes on very large lots. So there's not a lot of development uh, that had occurred. Now, one interesting thing uh, you can see here, uh, the red line is where the stream used to run in the 30s, and the blue line is where it was running in 2007 uh, before our project. But actually, the stream channel moved even more between the time we received our funding and before we were able to implement the project. And it's all because of stormwater runoff, improper stormwater management uh, that just created all of these problems. The underlying goal here was really to stabilize and improve this stream uh, in, the, in the habitat associated with the stream. But in order to do that, what we really needed to do was reconnect Walnut Brook with its floodplain and then recreate and enhance the riparian buffer that was associated originally with the stream. In doing so, then we would be able to increase flood storage so we can hold water back, you know, in this area as opposed to shooting it further downstream and causing more flooding and erosion problems uh, down gradient of the park. 
Uh, we could create some new wetland habitat, and it definitely provided a great opportunity for education in outreach. So uh, this is what a little bit of runoff can do. Um, you can see here that uh, and this is not even the worst portion of, of the stream channel, but you know we had portions where you know the bank was just caving in, uh, and the you know the depth from the top of the land to the stream. Uh, in some places was, you know, as much as 15 to 35 feet. I mean, that's pretty significant. Uh, but this caving, a lot of you have probably seen this. This is very common in suburban streams that are be, started to be subject to uh, uh, stormwater related erosional impacts. And as I mentioned, between the time we applied for funding and the funding was put into place and all the contracts were signed, the stream channel had moved another 23 feet in given areas. Uh, again, just a, a, a result of stormwater. And once you get conditions like this, it does not take much more to create even more damage uh, in a very short amount of time. And as you can see, there's no riparian buffer here. The stream is no longer connected to the floodplain. There's no, this is basically serving just as a conduit at this point to just channel water downstream. Here's some other evidence of you know, some of the problems that we were having, again, with the, with the bank incisement and uh, the caving in of the uh, turf into the stream channel. Uh, and some of the other egregious, this is, you don't really get a depth, a, a scale here. That's probably about an eight foot drop from the uh, top of bank down into the stream. And so, you know, the first thing we needed to do is, is a, a tremendous amount of hydrologic and hydraulic data analysis uh, because we really needed to fix the stream. And as you can see here, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into this. And yeah, there's a lot of rock that gets put into place. There's J hooks here. There's a variety of different stream uh, stabilization and stream restoration uh, techniques that are used uh, in this particular project. But the main thing that I wanna emphasize here is the reconnection of the stream and the floodplain, and then the restoration of that riparian buffer where there was none before. It was just mowed lawn right to the edge. So this is just some diagrams of like the various things, the rock veins, J hooks, things like that, that are utilized uh, in these high energy areas to dissipate flow and actually help the stream uh, communicate again with the floodplain. These are really done, you know, to kind of like control this head cut and this, you know, what will end up happening is that uh, you'll see this impact where this incising starts to work its way further and further upstream. So there's, yeah, there's downstream impacts that are occurring, but you start to see this head cut start to extend further and further upstream. So some of the things that were being done, uh, you don't really kind of like get uh, like the full value of it, but there's, you know, literally hundreds of willow stakes that were placed into the ground here. These are brush piles that, uh, brush mattresses rather, which I'll show you a little bit later, uh, that, we that we created. In various stones uh, in large rocks, they're actually pretty deep into the, into the stream bed. And some other techniques that we utilize really to stabilize uh, the, uh, uh, the amount of flow or, or address the amount of flow that was coming down the stream and, and stabilized the stream channel. Our goal uh, was really to get this to flood, jump its banks very frequently. You know, not before it was like the five-year event. Uh, you know, that's roughly around uh, somewhere around four inches of rain over about, well, maybe a little bit less than about three and a half inches of rain over about a 24-hour period. Uh, we really wanted the stream to be jumping bank uh, with as little as maybe an, an inch and a half of rain, but definitely for the one-year event, which is about 2.75 inches over 24 hours. So these more these smaller but more frequent events, we wanted the stream to jump bank. And so these devices not only are stabilizing the stream, but facilitating the stream to get back out into the floodplain. There's other ways of doing this. So a lot of times you think, well, the only thing I can do is go back and kind of like grade down or grade back, you know, some of these deeply incised channels. But in some cases, what you can actually do, and in this case, what we ended up putting in is extremely large boulders uh, to elevate the bottom of the stream. So actually bring the stream channel up 
during base flow conditions so that during a storm event, there would be that much less opportunity for it to flow downstream and more opportunity for it again to jump its banks without necessarily having to grade back a lot of the stream channel. When we got close to walking paths in like the ball field, you know, we really couldn't kind of grade back at like a 10 to one slope. I mean, we, you know, we had to work with what we had. You can see a lot of the willow stakes that are being put in along with the rock and these uh, boulders that were placed to elevate that stream channel. Some more of the work that was being done uh, by volunteers, willow stake plantings, uh, and a variety of other uh, plants that were placed higher uh, into on the, along the edge of our, our restored riparian buffer. And uh, you know these are the brush meadows, uh, the brush mattresses rather, where it's basically just willows, uh, willow stakes that are uh, uh, you know, basically uh, tied together and then laid down and then a layer of soil placed over them and they, they sprout and uh, do really well in terms of stabilizing uh, edges, particularly on the outside uh, edge of a, of, a, of a stream channel. Uh, here we have the you know, willow stakes that are in willow poles that a lot of you are familiar with. And this is you know, what things looked like about a year and a half after you know, completion. You can see that the uh, willow stakes are doing really well in terms of blooming. Um, this uh, was about two weeks after construction was completed. You can see you know, we've got our trees caged, some of the larger trees that we brought in. Um, and this uh, was uh, an inch and three point of uh, 1.37 inches of rain. So this is not even the one year event. This is about a half, a, uh, maybe what would be equivalent to half year event. But you know what's happening here is that we are maintaining uh, the, uh, uh, the stream flow without causing any kind of an erosional problem. Uh, you can see these backwaters that are being created. This is all where energy is being taken out of this stream flow as a result of the J hooks and the various other uh, measures that were placed in the stream channel. And then, you know, here we have, you know, uh, one of the other meanders a little bit, uh, this is a little bit lower down, you know, downstream uh, meander. Uh, you can start to see some of the plants starting to really colonize and do well in our buffer area. Uh, another portion of this project was to create a close to three acres of wetlands uh, that involved installing about 12,000 plants. Uh, we really uh, looked to keep it as you know all native plant material, but we really wanted to inc increase the ecological diversity and the floristic quality. So the value of that wetland uh, from an ecosystem standpoint that creates you know some uh, positive aesthetics, passive recreation, the way of, of birding. Those of you that know Mark know that he's a big birder, and so he tries to. Uh, infuse a lot of these types of elements in you know, his restoration projects. From my point of view, we were able to increase flood storage, nutrient and sediment uh, retention, and promote more groundwater recharge. Um, you know, another societal benefit here is that the county or the town, uh, Raritan Township, no longer had to do all the mowing that they, they were doing in these areas. Just let it go natural once we had got it planted and stabilized. Uh, there's a lot going on in this graph, but you know, just wanted to you know use this to emphasize the number of trees that were planted, and there's you know our wetland restoration areas and our, our riparian buffer uh, restoration areas. This is actually me over here, bent over, putting in some trees. This was a miserable day. It was cold and wet, but we had a, a whole bunch of volunteers that showed up, and uh, all of these gallon pots were put in, and a lot more. Uh, before the end of the day. We all left soaked and dirty, but it was a really positive day. And, you know, this is our created wetland area that's adjacent to our riparian buffer. Um, you can see here, this is, uh, you know, shortly after a storm and, you know, it's designed to be flooded on a frequent basis. Between storm events, this is what you see. It looks more like a, 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 a meadow area. So in summary, I'm pretty close to uh, my allotted time. Riparian buffers provide a variety of ecological services and functions, but you know, unfortunately, um, you know, a lot of those uh, services and functions get degraded very, very uh, quickly. Uh, and 
the value of these buffers often underestimated. And as a result of that, as I said, either you know, fear of nature or eminent domain, people feel that they have the right to clear uh, and destroy some of these areas, not understanding that they're actually hurting themselves in doing so. Uh, these areas are subject to a lot of various impacts, whether it's you know, because of agriculture or logging, land development, but even simple land maintenance. You know, just that simple mowing and clearing of vegetation uh, creates some major impacts uh, to riparian buffers and in turn to the quality of the streams that uh, they run by. So what can we do? Um, you know, I think you've heard the message uh, from our project partners here. You know, don't fill, don't disturb riparian buffers. Don't mow down vegetation, uh, remove trees, start to cut back. Uh, you know, practice good stormwater management. Uh, you know, improper stormwater management is definitely the leading cause of our water quality problems nationwide. Right now, about 80% of our water quality problems directly linked to non-point source uh, pollution. And that's just all a function of poor stormwater management. And there's things that we can be doing on our own uh, as well as uh, on a community scale uh, to uh, uh, reverse that. Wherever we have the opportunity, we want to protect and enhance uh, you know, that, that canopy. As I said before, uh, forested buffers uh, and uh, headwater buffers, uh, riparian buffers are significantly important uh, in terms of that entire stream ecosystem. Uh, when we have the opportunity, Yes, replace invasive species with native species. I know it's easier said than done. Uh, and then control and manage deer because a lot of our, our uh, secondary impacts, I think, in, you know, to our riparian buffers uh, is a function of, of deer browse. Any of you that uh, have gone out to Bowman Hill, you, know, you can see the value. Uh, you know, they fenced off areas and you can see without the deer browse, uh, how healthy those riparian buffers are that run through the streams as well as the native uh, forests uh, within the uh, uh, confines of, of Bowman's Hill. So in summary, you know, we have to get out there and, and restore. We want to make sure that we're designing with nature. We want to have good solid data to back us up. And, you know, our plan really wants to uh, reflect the, you know, the site's native ecology. I gave you an example of a, more of a suburban type of setting. Uh, versus uh, maybe a little bit more of an urban, like with the Lawanica Brook uh, by the uh, police station. Uh, those are all examples of things that can be done. The, the uh, Seton Hackney project, definitely you know, an example of a project that can be done in an agricultural setting, uh, whether it's a horse farm or not. And so, you know, yes, a healthy riparian buffer equal, equals a healthy stream. And it's not only because a river runs by it, but it's also because it runs through it and runs over it. So that's it for me this evening. I'd be more than happy to take some questions. I'll turn the screen sharing off. Um, and um, I guess it's all yours, Juniper. That was outstanding. I really appreciate that great presentation, Dr. Souza. Uh, you. you definitely inspired a lot of great questions. Um, so I know that we have until at least 8.30, so hopefully we can get through a few of those. I'd like to thank Zach, who is behind the scenes collecting all of these questions for me to ask. Um, and I have one of my own, but I'm not sure if I'm going to have time. I want to make sure I get these folks' questions in. And, uh, you know, so here and we go. One thing I, I just want to add, you know, if Please. there are some questions we can't get to tonight, if you collect them, shoot them over to me by email, and then I'll do my best to, you know, get to those questions later on. That's outstanding. We appreciate that. That'll be very helpful. Okay, great. So first question for the evening, what is the current state of quantifying and utilizing the value of ecosystem services related to riparian buffers? Is there a trend to increase acceptance and usage for decision making? I, I think there is. And I think that, you know, it may not be, let's say, in the actual discussion about riparian buffers, but you definitely see it with respect to flood management, where now we're sitting back and we're talking about the, you know, the, the uh, ecological services that are provided and the benefits of the community that are provided by 
creating or recreating resilient environments. And so, you know, with that, you know, a lot of the focus is on the floodplain, but the riparian buffer is part of the floodplain. And, you know, with these, uh, with, you know, some of these projects that, uh, you know, that, that are being done, like Lori was talking about the workout in, in, in Little Falls, where, you know, not only have we taken people out of the floodplain, but they've actually restored the floodplain, planted trees, got the, you know, you know, tried to make it functional again. I think that's where the dialogue, you see it the, the, the strongest is because in New Jersey, we've been impacted so much by flooding in some of these areas have chronic flooding, it's much easier to talk about the ecological services when it comes to stormwater and when it comes to flood management. Right, very good, excellent. Okay, here's another great question. A lot of waterways, streams and creeks in my town are on private lands. How can I go about getting these property owners to consider riparian buffers and implement green infrastructure? That's a really good question. And I think that number one, it, it comes down to uh, education and outreach, you know, and like anything else, um, you know, people are just inherently selfish. So you have to, you have to give them a message where they say, wow, this could benefit me. And then there might be, you know, action taken. So, you know, I've had situations where uh, people have, you know, have, have, would contact Princeton Hydro. They say, oh, my stream is failing and uh, I need some help here. And we'd go out and first thing, we, you know, they would want to do is I like, put a pipe in there. Oh, why can't we just like pipe it or culvert it or put a bunch of rock in here? And it's like, no, what you really want to do is sort of embrace this as a stream and, you know, think about how to do this in a way that, uh, you know, enhances the uh, environment and protects you at the same time. Now, granted, there's still a lot of work to be done because, you know, people, I, I do feel that people are inherently afraid of nature. And, you know, there's just this, I, I have to clear it. I have to get rid of all the snakes and the ticks and everything else. Uh, but it, it really comes down to education and, and, and outreach. You can regulate it as much as you want, but unless people feel, you know, that tie to the land, right. uh, it, it, it's going to be a difficult sell. So no, I I, I'm an optimist. I really feel that we can do this, but it's, it does take a lot of effort. I, I won't deny the fact that it takes a lot of effort. Yeah, it's definitely a what's in it for me thing. And I think that you do have to convince folks of the value. And then sometimes I think it, it's helpful to kind of talk about the, the cost of inaction. You know, all yes. that flooding that you talked about, all those consequences of not, you know, not taking proactive uh, action. Well, All right, some more, more great questions. Okay, I mean, we've had more success doing that with stormwater, particularly like with towns trying to get them to go to green infrastructure and get away from a standard detention basin to like a naturalized basin. And then when you tell them, well, you know, you're going to save yourself fifteen or ten or twenty thousand dollars a year in mowing, your your public works personnel could be doing something else other than mowing every week. Then you know they kind of sit up and say, okay, maybe that's not that bad of an idea. And then when they see it and you know they get people to accept it, uh, and so we've had I think we've had more success with that with green infrastructure. Right. Uh, but I have had projects uh, with you know landowners that uh, we've got been able to get in and sort of like change their uh, mindset on what that stream card is supposed to look like. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Moving on. So how do you plan for stormwater runoff from a parking lot when developing a buffer? Are there some basic steps to consider and how might stormwater utilities help protect and restore riparian buffers? Okay, so don't let me forget to talk about the stormwater utility part, uh, but you know, the first part is what I call divide and conquer. So with green infrastructure, to have green infrastructure work, you really need to be thinking about managing runoff from as close to the point of generation as possible. So, the, you know, the standard approach is to think about it at the end where it gets routed off of the parking lot and then you've got a whole bunch of water that you have to deal with. There may be other ways to redesign that parking lot so that you're managing some of that runoff prior to it getting over to the stream buffer. Uh, I've worked with a lot of lake communities and it doesn't take a lot of, again, changing their uh, thought process uh, when you start saying, okay, you don't need to give up like all, you know, a ton of parking spots. We can do this by managing the runoff 
closer to the point of, of generation. And then when we get closer to the stream, yeah, we're gonna have a buffer there, but they're envisioning, oh, we have to have a 50 foot buffer. Maybe we can do it with a 20 foot buffer, you know? So it, it really comes down to understanding the site and what I say, you know, like what I like to call sort of either turn your watershed inside out, think about like, you know, where water's coming from and deal with these small chunks rather than just trying to deal with it at the end. Right, okay, great. And, and the stormwater utilities, yes, absolutely. Because green infrastructure, the success of green infrastructure is a function of maintenance, okay? Just because it's natural does not mean it doesn't need to be maintained. And so to, you know, to have these green infrastructure uh, uh, strategies work over time, they need to be maintained. And the first thing that public works, you know, are gonna tell you, we don't have the money to do it. But with a stormwater utility, you can generate revenue in a very equitable way that allows not only for maintenance of existing features, but actually for new features. And then people are gonna be, they're gonna be incentivized to decrease the amount of impervious cover on their property. You see this in Philadelphia, you know, why is Philadelphia a green, you know, a green infrastructure capital? Because people with a lot of impervious cover get penalized. To decrease that, they do green infrastructure. So I, stormwater utilities, I know there's a lot of pushback on it, but I am a big, big advocate of stormwater utilities, not only in terms of green infrastructure, but the trickle down effect that it has on stream quality and water quality in general. Oh yes, uh, I'm a big proponent of that as well. Goodness knows the people who end up paying the price in their taxes for all of the damage that's done by not managing the stormwater. Right. When the folks who are actually causing the trouble could certainly be footing the bill. Okay, so that was actually a great segue into the next question, and we probably only have enough time for one or two more. But is there much maintenance required for a riparian buffer? Uh, what's the projected sustainability or lifespan for a completed project? That's a very good question. I think number one, um, you know, there is there is some maintenance, um, and uh, you know, this is where you know organizations like your own. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, you know, Bill and, you know, his folks can provide guidance on how individuals uh, can maintain these buffers. But, you know, the big thing you have to look out for is invasive species. Uh, you know, we have a lot of deer. We have to think about deer and deer management. Um, but, yeah, they do require maintenance. I, I'm not going to say they don't. Uh, but once you start to get a more mature uh, a vegetative cover, the degree of maintenance starts to go down. So it's really at, at the onset uh, where a lot of maintenance is required. But, uh, you know, what we used to do uh, is develop like an O&M plan, an operation and maintenance plan uh, that had just simple steps on, you know, what to look for, what to do. Um, so, you know, I, yes, it does require maintenance. I, again, just because it's natural doesn't mean you, you, you plant it and walk away from it. Right, right. Okay, well, it does seem like we are nearing the end of our evening. I want to ask you one quick question since I'm going to be greedy and I and I have you here so they can't stop me. Um, I was really interested in some of the pictures you were showing on the stream bank restoration work in a couple of those project areas. And I'm wondering on projects like that where they're putting a lot of riprap and rocks like along to restore the stream banks, but then they don't go the step further to also, you know, restore the buffer. Does the problem just continue? Because there's one area in particular I'm thinking of in, in Phillipsburg where I work, where they've done a, a repair to a large, uh, you know, scalloping on mm. the bank, which was completely eroded. And now it just seems like every time I go back there, the problem has moved to the opposite side of the repair. Right. And see, that's what ends up happening. If you just go do like a riprap dump and you start to just try to solve the problem by hardening the edge, then, you know, that's going to happen. But, you know, in certain areas, you know, where we were able to use the core logs, there was, a, you know, there was increased velocity there, but not so much that we had to put, you know, stone. But you're going to reach situations where, the, you know, the stream is going to have velocity and the flows are going to, you know, at a given rate that you need to use rock. But it's how that rock is placed. And then in addition to that, we're actually encouraging that stream to jump its banks. You know, most cases when a lot of riprap is dumped, it's just to move that water further downstream. So it's not really a repair. It's really just, I'm gonna 
send my problem down to somebody else. You know, it's it's, it's almost no different than than piping or culverting. You know, putting a culvert in that channel. Yeah, well, if you ever need a really good example of that, I've been uh, watching one occur over the years out here, so I can definitely give you one. All right, so hopefully what we'll do is when we send out the recording to all of today's attendees, we'll also send out uh, some of these additional questions and answers um, to those folks, because I know we didn't get to everybody's. I want to thank all of our partners who were with us today and who supported this webinar. I definitely want to thank you, Dr. Steven Souza, for such an outstanding presentation. Uh, there's a couple things I want to make sure I let you guys know before we go. Once again, this session was recorded, so you will be able to watch it uh, back again. Uh, and be sure to check out the New Jersey Highlands Coalition YouTube page because all of our webinars are there and there's some really great content. Uh, you'll be very excited um, if you get to take a look at those. And uh, also registration is currently open for our next webinar, uh, which is protecting natural resources in the Highlands. So we'll be talking to the New Jersey Highlands Council and ANJEC about how we are managing sustainable development in the region. And goodness knows there's a lot of development pressure. So managing it sustainably is gonna be a big objective moving forward. And so I think that that finishes us up for the night. I, I thank you all so much. I really appreciate everyone being here. Yeah, thank you guys too. And as I said, Juniper, if people do have questions, they, you know, feel free to pass them on to me. And I, I, I'm really good at getting back to people with on email. So uh, I'll do my best to, you know, to answer questions. So thank you. Thanks very much. No, I really appreciate it. This is simple stuff that people really just need to have an understanding of. And I think that the more conversations like this that we have, the more we can kind of change the public educational level. Absolutely. So. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for having me this evening and thanks everybody, you know, the, our, our sponsors and again, to you guys working behind the scenes, making this all happen. Appreciate it so much. Excellent, thank you. I guess we're all set, Zach. <laughs>